Hello, it's Dr. Courtney, also the Courting Happiness Podcast. Have you checked out our happiness library? It's a carefully curated library with books that I highly recommend that are a must for your happiness library. Go to drcourtneyalston.com forward slash happiness library. That's D-R-K-O-R-T-N-I-A-L-S-T-O-N dot com forward slash Happiness Library. The authors you will hear on the podcast can also be found in our Happiness Library. You can also purchase their books on our site. On top of that, your purchase also helps this podcast and the mission of courting happiness. Let's spread happiness and the word. Check out books on the Courting Happiness Library. It will not only change your life, but it can also help you with your next chapter too. Let's get back to the podcast. Welcome to the Courting Happiness Podcast. This is a space where self-care becomes part of your day. A space where you learn evidence-based strategies to help your life, share it with those you love, and cultivate well-being at work. I'm your host, Dr. Courtney Alston. I'm a former news director, television reporter turned happiness scholar, TEDx speaker, and transformational trainer. I also understand hardships. While working my dream job in television, I lived a nightmare suddenly becoming a young widow after 86 days of marriage. I became committed to learning more about resilience, healing, and happiness. This is how I discovered my area of research, which is positive psychology. Now I'm living my calling of training individuals and organizations on happiness. And my new chapter begins with being happily engaged. The courting and courting happiness is about a true courtship. I like to say commitment with happiness. The K in courting stands for the vulnerability of sharing my story, inspirational interviews with phenomenal people, the infusion of positive psychology, and so much more. You'll learn how to commit to your well-being one episode at a time. I hope you subscribe and share. So, are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to episode 43. I'm Dr. Courtney Alston. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for listening. Have you often wondered if your happy place is creating an online business? Or are you an entrepreneur that feels having an online company can help you reach your full potential, but you're feeling stuck? Well, we have an expert that will help get you back on track. Her name is Dawn Marcotte, and she joins the Courting Happiness podcast today. She is a mother, marathon runner, and the author of Success Guaranteed, Nine Lies Online Entrepreneurs Need to Know. She debunks a lot of myths during this episode. You're going to want to grab your notebook, I promise you, for this conversation. So let's get started and begin. Dawn, thank you so much for being here today. I am thank so you, Dr. Excited. Courtney. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. I will say this. Dawn reached out to me on LinkedIn. And to me, this is the power of LinkedIn. And um, I, I, when I got your email, I was so excited. Started to immediately look into your book, downloaded your book. So it is, it is nice, uh, nicely on my Kindle as, as, I, as I lifted up the show, Dawn, because we're communicating via Zoom. And I love the fact that you have really debunked myths. So we're going to talk about some of those myths during this conversation. But let's let's talk about your why. What brought you to creating this book and really focusing on online businesses? Well, I've been a freelance writer for many years, uh, over a decade, actually. So I started on the internet when it was new and shiny and nobody knew what we were doing um, as a just kind of a freelance writer for publishers who said, I need a 400 word article on how to re restore a Mustang, right? They were gaming the system. So I learned how to write that way. Um, but eventually I moved away from that to ghostwriting other people's books and then finally to writing my own books. But it's always been a side gig for me. I've been in the corporate world for my whole adult life. Um, but I love writing, love putting words together and love helping people and, and teaching people. Um, so what happened in 2020, as with many other people, I lost my corporate job. 
So I thought, well, let's take this thing that's been a side gig for all these years and see what we can do with it full time. And once I did that, I was just hit in the face with all of the marketing that is aimed at new entrepreneurs that is so misleading and it creates these unrealistic expectations. And me, who then online for, as I said, well over a decade and knows better, still bought into it. I still thought this is going to be great in 90 days. I'm going to be, you know, making six figures and sipping a beach on a beverage somewhere or sipping a, a beverage on a beach somewhere. Right. Yes. I bought it and I know better. And yet I still got sucked in. And so as I went along creating a full time business, I realized so many others had exactly the same thing happen to them. They had these unrealistic expectations and then they give up because they think there's something wrong with them. Why can't I figure it out? Why can't I get all those clients? What's wrong with me? And I thought, no, there isn't anything wrong with you. You're just, you got to keep at it. It isn't fast. It, it isn't easy as much as the marketing says that it is. So I thought, and I was actually kind of mad when I wrote this book. I'm like, no, you people cannot give up. Come back. <laughs> you need to understand um, and so that's really what got me into writing the book. So I actually then went out online uh, on Facebook specifically, and I was in a bunch of groups for new entrepreneurs and said, hey, I want to talk about this. What are the myths that you have struggled with? What has, has really been hard for you? And that's how I came up with the nine myths. So they're not just what I think. I went out and pulsed people and got uh, a lot of input into what are these top myths? So that's kind of how it got started and why I started writing it. That's the way my brain works. That's how I help people with writing books. And I thought this is something that needs to be said. People need to know this stuff. Well, I, one of the things I love so much, I, I love the fact that you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, all of these different uh, things that we hear so much about, right, in terms of online businesses. As, and you're right, in terms of it seeming as if it in a snap, you know, things, things happen. And I love that within your book, Dawn, you talk about these really rich stories. And guys, this book in terms of uh, the first off, I love the title success guaranteed. And but uh, it's success guaranteed the nine lives online entrepreneurs need to know. And what I love is that you really do a wonderful job sharing all of these powerful stories. How did you, you know, you, you kind of gave us an idea in terms of how it started, but mm -hmm. how did it kind of blossom to about what, 20 entrepreneurs that you, you, you talked with? Well, yeah, I, t I actually, I was so surprised and, and gratified because what I did is I'm in a couple of Facebook groups that connect podcasters with guests. So I went to those groups and I said, listen, I know this is not a podcast, but this is the book I want to write. Does anyone want to volunteer to just talk to me about your journey? And I had over 50 entrepreneurs sign up and say, oh, yes, I would love to talk to you and help you with this. So I just was amazed that I got so many. But of course, 50 is way too many. I couldn't talk to everybody. I just didn't have the time and, and the book would end up being way too big. So I kind of narrowed it down to about 20, 25 entrepreneurs that I spoke to. And then once I actually wrote the book, you know, I picked and chose which stories really fit the, the questions and the myths and the, and the stories that I thought would really resonate with people because I wanted to make sure that I had as wide a variety as I could. So there are service entrepreneurs, there are product people, people with e-commerce, brand new people who've been in business for less than two years and people that have been in business for more than 30 years. So all the way across the spectrum, so that as readers are, are reading through it and finding out about these people, they go, oh, there's a single mom. I'm a single mom. If she can do it, I can figure out how to do it too. Or there's somebody taking care of their parents or somebody that's got a chronic illness, whatever it is. I wanted to make sure to include all of those different stories to show the flexibility and the possibilities that are out there on the internet. 
I love that you're talking about the possibilities. And, you know, as a happiness scholar, my area of research, I focus uh, on, you know, creating happier workplaces and well-being at work. But I also focus in on meaningful work. And what I love so much about your book is that it allows us to see all of these incredible, really inspirational stories of Mm -hmm. people really sharing truth right in terms of their right. journey but then also being able to express one's full potential do you find that within online businesses people able to really express their full potential i really do i have run into a lot of people over the years and most of them are in online business because they're passionate about something Maybe it's something that happened in their life that they've solved a problem and they want to help others solve the same problem, or they just made it through that situation and they want to help others, you know, navigate through whatever it is. Most people have some sort of passion and why of of getting out online and they want to share that. They want to make the world a better place. And I really see a lot of them striving to continuously learn. That's the other thing. They don't just go out there, put up a a shingle, I'm in business now, and then stop. They keep learning and growing as people and growing in what they know and their ability to help others. And I think that is so inspirational. And so many different businesses, too. I mean, things that you would never think that someone could make money doing, they find a way to make it work for them. I'm curious, what was the most unique business? You know, I think my favorite one was the woman who turned scrapbooking events into a full-time job. So yeah, so she actually made enough that she could buy the house next door specifically to hold Facebook or uh, scrapbooking events. And the thing about it that was so neat was it wasn't the scrapbooking part. It was bringing the people together, these women who would primarily women who would come together for a weekend and get to know each other and form friendships that then lasted over time. And I just thought, what a great way to build community. That was just amazing to me. That and it's very artsy and I'm not a very artsy person. So anybody who can do anything like that, I'm just amazed. Yeah, that, well, that they do it. And it's so beautiful because mine is not. Yeah, that is, that is incredible. But I love the fact that it's creativity meeting community. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, and I think that's kind of the beauty of online businesses, you know, with some of them, right. Depending on right. what the specific uh, purpose is in regards to their mission. But I love that in terms of, you know, creating community. So let's kind of dive in deeper okay. into, into, in terms of your book, Dawn. You talk a great deal. Actually, you give a lot of wonderful strategies throughout the book. And one of the things that I love that you talked about is three steps to building a a business. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what those steps are and why they are so important. Great. Thank you for asking. That's a, I love that question because it's so important. Um, A lot of people that jump online, they're there because somebody said, oh, you're really good at this. You should go make a business. And then they don't know what to do. So the first step is to understand who is your ideal client? Who do you want to serve? Who do you want to help? And be as specific as possible, age, gender, geographic location, uh, socioeconomic status, education, everything. Be as specific as you can be when you're first starting, realizing it's going to change And it's going to get refined over time. So don't think that what you come up with right away is going to be the end all be all. It will change over time, but you need some place to start. So for me, for example, I help women. It just, that's who I resonate with and that works for me. So that was where I started women. Okay. Well, that's half the world. So we need to narrow it down a little bit from there. Um, The, Importance of this is that it will inform everything you do after that step, your marketing, your offer, everything. So this is really important to understand who you want to serve. And of course, part of that is figuring out where are they? And this is usually social media that I'm speaking of, because that's where most new entrepreneurs go because it's free. 
So when you start your marketing, you go and do what's free. So are they on Facebook? Are they on LinkedIn? Whatever. It's, it's different. If you are marketing to a corporate CEO, then you're probably going to go to LinkedIn. But if you're marketing to a mom, you're probably going to go to Facebook. You need to understand those things. And there are resources out there that you can Google that will that have already done the research for you and will tell you, you know, this age bracket, this gender, this job, all that kind of stuff. So understand that. And then the second step is to build your offer. So a lot of people who start don't necessarily have anything to sell, which is good because the best way to build an offer that's going to sell is to involve your audience in it. Go to them and say, I'm thinking about starting a coaching program. What would you want? Do you prefer group? Do you like individual? Do you want an online class? Do you want a book, right? Figure out what they want. It's not about you. It's about them. And when you follow a process through where you're asking them and refining and saying, here's this, what do you think? And getting that input that when you finally have an offer that you're happy with and you say, hey, guess what? I'm ready to start selling this for money now. You will have a ton of people who are ready and willing to buy it because they helped you create it. They feel like they've got some skin in the game. Now, there's a whole process behind that, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail there, but that's in general a great way to build an offer. And then finally, of course, then you market that offer. You need to talk to people about it. And this, again, is where it's so important to understand your ideal client because as a consumer, we all know we are constantly bombarded with information, constantly bombarded with people selling us stuff, and we ignore most of it because most of it doesn't really apply to us. So when you understand your ideal client and the words that they're using in their head and the issues that they have and their immediate problem that they will pay you lots of money if you can solve this for them, when you start talking about that, they are going to listen because it's going to resonate and they're going to go, oh, hey, that person really understands me, really understands what I need. I'm going to at least check into them at least go to their website. Even if I don't choose to buy right now, maybe I'll get on their email list and they'll send me you know, updates monthly or weekly, whatever, right? And, and get, it, get pulled into that circle of influence as, as uh, Stephen Covey called it in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective Entrepreneurs, my favorite book, by the way. Anyway, so that's kind of the third step is that marketing. And then it's just, it's just a cycle after that. Okay, you've got this first offer out there. Great. And things are going great. But you know what? Maybe we should have another offer. We should have something at a different price point. We should have something that appeals to a different set of people. So for example, for me, I tend to have a book like I have, but I also have online classes because not everybody likes to read. Some people like to listen. Um, I have a website that has a membership because not everybody wants free stuff. Sometimes they feel like, you know what, if I pay you a little bit, you're going to give me a little bit more, whatever. I trying to appeal to the different educational needs of people is also important. But in general, those are the three steps. You figure out who your audience is, where they are, you build an offer and you start marketing it to them. I love it. And by the way, I love Stephen Covey as well. <laughs> And I, I will say that what I love so much about what you're sharing is uh, really understanding your ideal customer, right? Um, but then also um, allowing them to take part in that process. I, I, I really treasure that because I think that's also important in terms of making sure that you understand what the market needs or understand what your customers need, right? Um, and so earlier you mentioned going, well, that entrepreneur that is really going and speaking to their audience. So for a person that's listening, that's a new entrepreneur, where would they even begin in regards to maybe talking to their audience or meeting their audience, right? To be able to kind of garner that type of intel. Well, it depends on what you're doing for a business. And the reason I say that is a lot of people know more than they think they know. They are starting a business around some sort of passion that they have. So for example, I'm a runner. If I went back and started from scratch, I might start some sort of business around running. Well, 
I think, my gosh, how do, how do I know what to do? Well, I'm in running clubs. I, I have a magazine that I get for runners. I've got all of this different stuff that I just do because it's a hobby I enjoy that has impact and, and has connected me to people in that hobby. So take a look at your own life. You know, are you in some sort of group that is associated with that? Or maybe there's an online forum or a Facebook group that you're in that is around that topic. Start there. Start local with you in your own life where you already have connections. Um, or even, you know, other groups where you just start talking about, hey, I've been thinking about doing this. And somebody else might say, oh, well, I know so-and-so, and they would be really interested in talking to you about that. Those kind of things. So come up with a, like a little elevator speech that you can share with people um, that doesn't go too deep, but it can at least give people an idea so that you can start networking and gathering that. And then, of course, the almighty Facebook um, if you have something specific, you can always go and search for groups that have that name in the group and just join them. You don't have to say anything, just kind of lurk, read, see what people are saying, see what the atmosphere is, see if that resonates with you. And if it doesn't, leave the group. <laughs> There's so many people out there who are in hundreds of Facebook groups. And you can't effectively manage that. You're, they're not all seeing your stuff. You're not seeing their stuff. Leave the group and go find a different one so that you can focus your time and your energy where it needs to be, where it's doing the most good. But, and you can also do the same thing on LinkedIn. They also have groups. That works a little bit differently there. Um, I'll be honest. I have no idea how Instagram works. I'm out there. No idea what I'm doing. But if you happen to be familiar with that and knowledgeable, that may be another place that, again, you can type in hashtags and find people that are talking about that topic that you can connect with. I, you know, it's great that you mentioned um, narrowing down those groups because it can be kind of addictive, right? You sign up, you oh, go, yeah. sure, yeah, I'll join in. And next thing you know, you look at your list and you go, wow, do I have over 100 or 200 <laughs> Right <laughs> groups that I'm a part of, and that can be overwhelming. And so, terribly overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I love that you talk about kind of narrowing that down. Mm -hmm. The the advice that I'm always giving that I should follow myself and don't is that be in three to five groups, Facebook groups. If you if you're going to be on Facebook, three to five groups and limited to that. Now I'm in more than that, and most everybody is. But I do have three groups that I go into every single day. And I read everything that's posted that day and really focus on building relationships in those three groups. The rest of it, as I have time, fine, I'll check it out, whatever. But I don't focus on those. By doing that, by narrowing it, I have found that my reach has gotten bigger, even in those other groups that I don't go into as much. Because Facebook sees who I interact with, sees who I form relationships with, and shows my post to more of that in other places when I post in other places. Facebook is watching you. Oh, gosh, they are certainly watching, aren't they? And I, and I think that's also great practice, right, for a person who's developing their ideal customer, right? Mm -hmm. And then you having to narrow it down. So kind of narrowing down some levels of your habits, right? Mm -hmm. Really can help in terms of narrowing down levels of your focus as it relates to uh, really understanding your customer even more. I, I love that because it allows for us to hopefully not feel overwhelmed, right? Right, right. And that's so many new entrepreneurs. There's just such a huge influx of information. It's, it is, it's overwhelming. And to be able to consciously make a decision and say, no, I am not going to allow that. I'm going to focus here. It makes it much, much less stressful. Absolutely. So let's talk about um, another story. Her name okay. is Laura, right? Mm -hmm. Mindset coach. Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned in, in your book how she talked about um, the importance of, of really uh, investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. But then also, I love this, 
uh, uh, not thinking in terms of making tons of money and living happily ever after. And I think I say that because I think that that quote in itself is so important. It goes back to the myth, right, mm-hmm. of, you know, all you have to do is get started, which is great to get started and things would just end up happening. But listening to you, the importance of learning, the importance of time, the importance of building community. How has Laura, that story in terms of really valuing the importance is so interesting because she's a mindset coach, talks about the shift, right? Right, right. And mindset. So how important is mindset? It is huge. Absolutely huge. And it's not necessarily mindset in the way a lot of people think about it, because it's different for everybody. You know, some people come in and they have a personality that is very focused already and very organized. And so they're not going to need to to worry about that. But they have other mindset things that maybe they tend to compare themselves to others a lot. And they have to realize that it's not going to work because you don't know where that other business is in the life of that business. And that's one of the things that was common throughout all of the interviews that I did that I thought was amazing. None of them said money was why they were doing it. Not one. There was always another reason, a deeper reason that had to do, maybe it was family or it was flexibility or travel or or something else. They're not in it to make big bucks. If they make enough to keep the family comfortable, that's good enough. They're not in it for the six or seven figures. And I I was a little surprised at that just because of the wide variety of people that I spoke with. I thought at least one of them would say, well, yes, I started this because, you know, whatever. But they didn't. It It was all about that deeper meaning. And mindset came in for a lot of them early on figuring out what that deeper meaning is because they got sucked into the usual, well, I need to be making $5,000 a month or I need to be making $10,000 a month. There's something wrong with me. I'm not doing that. And they all had to deal with that and pivot away from that and realize that's just a marketing tactic. That's not reality. That's not what I am in business for. I need to walk away basically from that mindset. And I think every single one of them talked about that shift somewhere in their business that they came to that understanding. It's interesting because I I also loved that you talked about uh, because it kind of folds right into the next, uh, you know, uh, element within your book. When you talk about redefining success, Mm -hmm. right? So how important is that? Because as you're sitting here, you're you're sharing about Laura, and then we're also talking about other entrepreneurs. And then we we hear so much, right, in terms of the marketing aspect of, you know, six figures or seven figures, right? Right. But, But how can we redefine success? And why is it so important to do that as as an entrepreneur? Well, it's really, really important to understand your why and the why usually leads to a definition of success. So for me personally, I define success by when I get those emails or messages that say, hey, I really appreciate what you said, or this really helped me or that. Thank you for telling me to do that little tactic that helped my mark, whatever, That, that appreciation. I love that. That's what I live for. And when I started the business, I understood that about myself, that I am a helper. That's just who I am. I am a servant. I live to serve. Um, You can ask my bosses. I used to tell them that all the time. I live but to serve, right? And it's true. But that's how I define my success for me. Now, someone else, like my brothers, I have two brothers. They both have their own businesses. One of them would not define his success that way. He defines his success more around the number of people that he coaches. How has he impacted their lives? Because he coaches on a different, uh, he's a personal coach. But anyway, so his is more about seeing them learn things, seeing them move forward. Uh, Somebody else, it might be about just making sure that they can be there for their children who are grade school age and aren't going to be grade school age for their whole lives, right? And enjoying that time 
rather than that struggle of, oh my gosh, I got to work 12 hours a day. And I have this great line. When, when I was a uh, corporate person with a side gig, I would come home and my children didn't understand what the word emergency means. Losing the TV remote in the couch is not an emergency. So I finally told them, if you are not bleeding or on fire, do not open that office door. <laughs> Mommy's working, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that, but I learned that's not what I want. That's not the right balance. And so I stepped back from that. But learning that, what is that balance for you is different for everyone. And you have to figure it out for yourself. And once you do, and you really embrace that, it makes other things so much easier to say no to. Again, that marketing that's telling you what you should be doing, what you should be thinking or feeling. When you really understand what feels right to you for success, you can look at that and say, nope, that's not me. I'm going to ignore that and move on. I'm not going to listen to that coach because that's not me. I'm going to go find somebody that does resonate with my why statement. I love that. Someone that really speaks to your why mm -hmm. in, in terms of partnering with that person, in terms of uh, speaking to your why and understanding really what success means to you. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Myth number four. Let's talk <laughs> about that. Because it, 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 it says it's all about product or service mm -hmm. and will work for everyone. Yep. And I again, love it's this marketing tactic, right? You yeah. put it out there because they promise these big leaps forward. If you just buy their process or their product, they're going to solve that problem for you and you're going to jump forward and your business is suddenly going to take off. Now, I'm not saying that's not true. It may work very well, but it's not going to work very well for every single person. You need to understand the, the underlying logic and, and processes that go into that. So for example, I am in a Facebook group with a wonderful woman who has a great coaching program, and she is the most extroverted person I think I have ever met in my life. She could sell snow to Eskimos. And so enthusiastic. And I thought, yeah, this is great. But then because I have many years of experience, I realized I'm like, okay, I need to dig a little bit deeper before I sign up with her to be my coach. And so I attended a couple of her free seminars and just did a little more digging. And I realized, nope, not going to work for me. Because she is so extroverted, that mindset is built into the program. And it's a wonderful program, but I am not an extrovert. So it would be very hard for me to do the kind of outreach that comes so naturally to her. So when you understand those kinds of things and can, can take that into account, you are more likely to find a coach or pick a product that is going to work for you. You need to understand who you are, what you're comfortable doing. And I'm not saying don't step outside your comfort zone, but there are some personality traits and some things that just aren't really going to change. And if somebody's asking you to make 20 sales calls, cold calls a day, and you don't like talking on the phone, probably not going to be the right process for you. So, you know, really understand that. And I don't want to call people out and say, you're a liar. That doesn't work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it doesn't work for everybody. You need to understand yourself and you need to understand them and their process before you buy in and decide that's what you want to do. That's what you need. I, you know, it's, I, as a professor, and I can really appreciate what you're sharing. And then also the person, the MBA in me appreciates what you're saying because the professor in me says, well, you know, Dawn, you're absolutely right. We all have different learning styles, right? And the, right. the, the MBA in me says, and I love the fact that you're talking about finding your voice and staying true to yourself opposed yeah. to seeing another model 
And it may seem well or work well for other people, but you it may not work well for you based on maybe your style or based on, you know, in terms of your differences in community. Um, mm -hmm. And so I love that because what it does, it allows an individual, especially an online entrepreneur who may be going and uh, trying to sort out where to go next, it allows them to understand the importance of finding someone that speaks to you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and so I love what you shared in myth number four, because I was like, yes, it, it, it may not work for everyone. You know? <laughs> and, exactly. And that's and that's OK. But you're giving people tools to kind of stand up in terms of their own truth to understand you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to stand up for what works for me opposed to, you know, just, just sitting and, and adhering to that person that sharing that information. And it may not really speak to you. Exactly. You know, we, we talked about a lot of myths and I could probably talk about every, I, 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 I feel like I could talk about each and every one of them because they're so powerful, but I know we're limited as relates to time. Tell us about the most common one outside of the ones that we've already discussed. So I think the most common one is that we somehow should be able to figure this out on our own, that we, we don't need any help. There's lots of free information out there online. We should be able to just put it all together and figure it out. No support needed. And that is so not true. There, and there are a lot of entrepreneurs who the only support system they have when they first start is, is their family, their, their spouse or their significant other, or maybe, you know, friends, that kind of thing, which is great because those can, people can be very supportive. But if you start talking to them about Google Analytics and they don't understand what you're talking about, they're really not going to be very helpful. So it is really important to form a support community that includes other entrepreneurs, whether it's virtually on social media or a coaching program, a mastermind program, or even in real life, your local Rotary Club or you know whatever you might have in your community that you can join that has business people. It's so important to build those connections so that when you have a bad day or you have a problem, you can go to them and say, I just can't seem to figure out this Facebook ad thing. I, I just don't get it. Where am I going wrong? And somebody will who, because you are not the only one having that problem, I guarantee you. Somebody else is gonna say, oh, well, I did this, or I talked to this person, or I read this book. This would be a great help, check this out. And so you can help each other and build each other up. And when you have a great day, Hey, I just booked, you know, three clients. This is really great. My first three clients and they will all cheer you on. And that is just as important as lifting you up when you're having a tough day. So find that community, build that community and lean on that community when you need to. You know, as soon as you shared that, I, my mind went to probably about maybe a week or two ago. And uh, this is when Kajabi made the announcement. Kajabi is the platform that I use for my online courses and, um, and membership. And Kajabi made the announcement that you can now do have podcasts on Kajabi. And, and, and so, you know, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I was, I was so excited. And so I was texting other people who within my circle, who are either entrepreneurs or thinking about becoming podcasters too. And it felt good being able to share that. And yeah. I'm so glad that you shared it that way, because I think that's so important in terms of understanding um, having people in your circle that can really help direct and inspire and also empower you, mm -hmm. you know, it's, which is so very important. And so those, those very people that I shared that with, you know, are coaches and are, you know, are, are incredible trainers trained by Jack Canfield. And it was great being able to hear that uh, back 
from them. Like, yes. So you're so right in terms of really valuing having this support system. I will say this also that in positive psychology, uh, positive relationships, I like that we qualify them. It's all about having positive relationships in your life. I'm curious, Dawn, who yeah. makes up your tribe? Because you are so incredible in terms of the work that you're doing as relates to your book. I, you know, I've taken a peek uh, at your Facebook community, which is incredible as well. I was like, wow, oh, you. you have so many wonderful things um, and you're such an incredible and empowering coach. What does your community look like to kind of keep you, you know, uh, inspired and supported? You know, I actually have got a couple of different things. Um, in my case, my family is important. As I mentioned, I have two brothers. They are also entrepreneurs. And so, you know, we can talk. And my dad was too before he retired. So that's maybe kind of where I get that that bend from in the first place. But then I also have my Facebook group is very important. They're great women. I, I love them. And then I have, I'm in an introvert's Facebook group on uh, face. I know, I know, but I am. Um, and I absolutely adore it because some, it just feels right. And they understand me and they get me and I can post things and I, and they're like, yeah, <laughs> right. And, and the same when other people post things, I can comment and say, yes, I felt exactly the same way when I tried to do a Facebook live that I will never do again. <laughs> right. Which isn't quite true, but um, you know, just, finding that group where they really understand me. So those, those are probably my most supportive uh, areas, most supportive communities. And of course I have a friend that I've had for 30 plus years through moves and family and the whole nine yards. And, and she's really great and very supportive as well. So it's kind of a combination of real people in real life and uh, people in virtual. I love that in terms of the fact that you have such such a range in regards to, to your support. You know, um, I want to ask one more question, um, sure. actually a couple of more, uh, even though we're we're about to um, unfortunately in 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 our episode. And I don't even want to do it, guys, because I'm like, I can ask Dawn this question and that question. <laughs> I'll come uh, back again. Just, you have to. We'll you know, do a part two. <laughs> yes, I really would love for you to come back to talk about you know, the importance of growing community online and what that even looks like in terms of Facebook. That's why I said, gosh, I could ask Dawn questions all day. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us uh, out of all the people that you've interviewed, right? Mm -hmm. What is one of the entrepreneurs that really left you feeling transformed? Well, I have a little bit of a cheat in that, I'll be honest, because I actually interviewed my own coach. So I'm not sure that counts because she transformed me in so many ways. That was the, one of the reasons I really emphasize the need for a coach because she answered questions I didn't even know I had, let alone knew to ask. So I hired her to help me with my Facebook group and to create a sales funnel with my Facebook group, which she did over the course of 12 weeks, it was fantastic. But I would run into other things and I would I would come to our, our group and I'd be like, oh, I just can't believe, and it's all going wrong and why can't I figure this out and blah, blah. And she'd be like, oh no, Dawn, you just need to go over to Instagram and go in and do these three things. And it will, and I'm like, I would never have figured that out on my own. There's no way I would have figured that out. So she really transformed me, but, she transformed me because she says better done than perfect. And I found that so motivating. And I still tell people that don't wait to make it perfect. Don't wait until you think it's right. Don't keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and never taking action. Done is better than perfect. And I've put some things out there that kind of make me go, Oh, I can't believe I put that out in public. Why did I do that? Um, but done is better than perfect. And because I did that, then I frantically go, okay, I, I got to make it better. Let's quick make it pretty <laughs> and, and let's roll. Um, but that, just that statement done is better than perfect was so life-changing for me. 
I love that. Done is better than perfect. Again, it speaks to the value of putting it out there, right? Mm-hmm. And kind of, and it's, it's challenging in, in regards to when, when, when you think of your business, especially if it's your baby, right? You, you right. consider it your baby and you consider your ideas part of your baby and you're putting them out there and you go, oh, but it's important. I love that in terms of just getting it done and, mm-hmm. and really making sure that they're born, right? That, yep. that they have a, they have a place. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I, I hate ending this show. Um, and so one of the questions I want to ask you um, mm-hmm. is this. You talked about your coach transforming you. Mm-hmm. Where can Courting Happiness listeners find you so you can continue to help transform them? Well, the best place to find me is on my Facebook group. It's called Women Coaches and Consultants Growing Our Business. I do have to give fair warning. There is one man in the group. He's our token male. Um, (laughs) And I let him in because he let me on his podcast. So (laughs) um, anyway, it's a great group. It is really, really wonderful. Uh, Very supportive. We're all about networking. I'm actually going to start doing weekly networking in uh, the rooms, use the rooms function um, to try and get people to talk to each other instead of just talking to me all the time and really start that networking. So that's kind of the next step for that group, but that's the best place to find me. I am on Instagram. I don't understand Instagram very well. And I am also on LinkedIn. So just Dawn.Marcotte uh, or Don Marcotte on LinkedIn or on Instagram. Any of those places are great places to find me. I love giving free advice. So please feel free to reach out with any questions. And I will you know, be more than happy to share what knowledge I have with you. I love it. And so one of the things we always end with uh, in terms of the Courting Happiness podcast, because it's all about how do you commit to your well-being and commit to your happiness? Mm -hmm. So how do you as I mean, you (laughs) are a a runner, a mother, uh, a writer, uh, (laughs) a coach, the list goes on. How do you go about committing to your well-being or committing to your happiness and with all that you're doing? Well, I find scheduling is really important. If it's on the calendar, it gets done. So I schedule time in the morning. There, there are certain things that I want to do every day. I have, I have prayer time every day. I exercise most every day, even if it's just a walk. Um, but I put it on my schedule so that it doesn't become one of those, oh, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later kinds of things. When you actually write it down, and I have a to-do list, so I write it down there as well. There's something that's just wonderful about just drawing a line through each item as it gets done every day. I'm sure there's some psychology behind it, but yeah, putting it on a schedule makes sure that it gets done. And I look at my whole week, So I do this once a week, plan weekly, prioritize daily. So that way I can look forward and what's going on in the business, what's going on personally. Okay. You know, on Tuesday I can go for my walk at two, but on Wednesday, I'm going to need to do it at nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. Let's put it on the calendar. We're good. I love that in terms of being intentional and scheduling it. That's, that's really a great way in terms of making sure that you're always maintaining your well being. Thank you so much for scheduling your time with us today, Dawn. Your book is incredible and so are you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Courtney. Let's continue this conversation online. Email us at podcast at drcourtneyalston.com. That's podcast at D-R-K-O-R-T-N-I-A-L-S-T-O-N Dot com. Join us on Instagram at Courting Happiness. Don't forget, that's Courting with a K. Also, I hope you join our private Facebook community. You can find us at Courting Happiness Podcast Community. Our private Facebook group is a safe haven to share, meet more people looking to build positive relationships, focus on well-being, and create a happier life. 
Now, are you ready to spread happiness? We hope you subscribe and share this podcast with your family, friends, coworkers, and all the important people in your world. We release a new episode every Thursday. Congratulations on your continued commitment to your courting happiness journey. Thank you so much for listening. We want you to be well, be happier, and be kinder to yourself. We can't wait to see you next week.